Good evening, everybody. This is week four. This is Daryl, and uh, this is our final week of class. Uh, this is the week in which we're going to take our presentations and plus them up, make them even better than before using the magic of feedback. So that's what our focus is of this week. It's on feedback. Uh, I'm going to give you feedback. You're going to get possibly feedback from your classmates. You will have your own sort of uh, self-reflection. And we're going to practice giving feedback uh, as well in another assignment. I want to go through that. But um, those of you that have turned in your presentations, your, your uh, first drafts, uh, I spent the day going through as many as I could. Uh, I have not finished them all. So if I haven't gotten yours done yet, you should get feedback from me tomorrow. I know it's important for you to get feedback from me so that you can know how to go forward. Uh, and so uh, that's really what we're focused on this week. We're taking the work that we've done so far and we're looking at it and we're saying, is this the best we can do? We're evaluating it. We're evaluating it you know, along different lines, along the story construction, around the audio vocal performance, about the visual power, about its pacing and length. You know, there are a number of things that you can comment on and I'm trying to give you my best advice. So uh, I don't necessarily comment on all aspects, but when I give you feedback, I'm talking about what I think works and doesn't work. And I, I make suggestions for things that you could add to or subtract. Um, we, we've, we've set a target time of three to four minutes and, um, not everybody's story fits equally into that. Some people go over and it's perfectly fine because it just moves so swiftly. And some people um, are underneath time and still haven't really told me very much. So um, if you're not in the target time market, uh, a target time of the assignment, I may ask you to trim it down or add more, but it really has to do with how it feels. Uh, we know that presentations work best if they're brief and three to four minutes is pretty brief. If you go a little bit over to four and a half, five minutes, that's still pretty brief as well. But a presentation that works best at three and a half minutes can feel uh, bloated at four minutes or four and a half minutes. So uh, we want to make the best possible impression we can. And that's what feedback helps us to do. We get the opinion of others and we learn how to make things better. Uh, there's one last bit of reading that we're asking you to do this week, and that is uh, the final chapter of Resonate that you haven't read. Uh, and uh, touchingly enough, it deals with the subject of feedback, how you can use feedback to improve your process to make your work better. And so um, that's what I want to deal with. And I want to say goodbye to Nancy Duarte. I hope that most of you had a good experience reading the Nancy Duarte literature and that you carry forward with it the lessons that we learned from her. And a huge chunk of what we're trying to do with this uh, presentation that we're working on this month is to set forth a sense of your personal brand. Uh, branding is a term that you're going to hear an awful lot about it at Full Sail. And it basically sets forth the idea that you and your skills are like a company or a company service. That it's a, a sort of thing that you could market in and of itself. You, as a creative person, are a brand. And um, hopefully they're a brand that people trust and believe in and, and desire. And so your reputation is the sort of thing that can go around the world without you. In the, in the world of uh, digital and internet, uh, you, you can work on projects, you can have your name attached to different things. Uh, people can see your work in, in, in places without your knowing about it. And your reputation can spread without even your control over it. And you wanna try to have as much control as you possibly can. So we're gonna talk a little bit about how do you protect and maintain your brand? How do you how do you do things that add to add lust to the brand? How do you not do dumb things that might hurt your brand? And as you're in college right now and not yet out in the professional world, 
this is a good time to begin this conversation. We're not going to finish anything here. Again, this is always month one. We're starting the conversation. And, and through the next several months, as you go through Full Sail, um, you're going to hear a lot from Full Sail about uh, how to think about your brand, how to sell yourself to employers and the creative uh, uh, world, and uh, how to protect your reputation. Uh, another word for brand is reputation. Uh, and so one of the things we do in trying to look at uh, brand uh, maintenance is just to see, you know, um, what are we trying to do when we put forth a notion of who we are? And we look at what corporations do and uh, corporations have entire departments that, that maintain and affect their brand. And the number one rule of trying to get your brand out into the world is be transparent is to not try to pretend that you're something that you're not. We're all used to selling ourselves through these things called resumes, which nobody likes anymore and nobody really pays much attention to. We still have to do resumes. They're part of the dance ritual of employment, but really um, they're not used very much. They're not weighted very much. And they have gotten a bad reputation because everyone assumes that everyone else lies on your resume. And uh, they, you build yourself up, you put forth the best version of yourself possible. That's always permitted, but then it becomes a very slippery slope to just uh, telling uh, a fib here and there. And from a fib here and there, sometimes your resume can get bloated to having all sorts of uh, skills and experiences that you don't really possess. And uh, people have enough bad experience with resumes that they tend not to believe them anymore. So they want to do face-to-face -face interviews. They want to see your portfolio of work that you've actually done. You know, those would tell you a lot more. And the kind of presentation that you're creating about yourself can tell us a lot more about who you really are than your resume. And so a brand is something that we want to always be transparent. People see the real us. People understand what skills we have and don't have. And in terms of protecting that, there's just a very few rules. Be honest. Say what you can do. Say what you can't do. You know, if, if you don't yet know how to, how to uh, run Maya, you know, don't pretend that you do. If you go into an interview and someone asks if you can, you know, uh, uh, run Maya uh, or a certain version and, and you don't know and you just figure that you can lie and say yes and watch a few YouTube videos over the, overnight and, and get caught up, well, that's going to bite you. You always want to be honest about what you can and cannot do. And if you're skillful, there's enough that you can do that outweighs the things that you don't know yet know. And possibly in talking about what you don't know, you, you, you reveal yourself to be an eager learner or someone who's very quickly capable of picking up the skills that someone's asking for. Be unique. Um, a lot of what happens at Full Sail is that students go to school and you acquire all the skills that the other students at the school have. And if you graduate and you pass, then you think that resume entitles you to a job. It doesn't necessarily entitle you to a job. It, it, it says this student knows as much as every other student there. And one of the things you want to do during your journey at Full Sail is not only discover what you can do that everybody else can do, but figure out what you can do better than other people. What, what talents do you have that sometimes rise above? You may have come to school to be a 3D animator or a, a, a film producer or an audio engineer, and you're learning all the same uh, techniques and skills that everyone else does. But there may be one particular technique that you picked up really well or you just simply have a natural talent for and you didn't even know it until you you, you ran across it and you you actually uh practiced it but that becomes the thing that you can sell yourself for what are the unique talents that you have that you can do better than other people and college is a great time for self-discovery of trying to figure out what it is in your talents that make you rise up above the pack and not just be part of the pack and finally, don't compromise. As you're beginning your career, it's very easy to take a job that you shouldn't or 
work for a, a, a pay level that, that uh, is unsustainable. But if you compromise early, it's hard to get out of. And uh, it, it hurts to say no, but very early on, you can make yourself um, uh, save yourself a lot of trouble by refusing to do projects that you know are not going to add to your overall development or uh, pro, um, skill level. And I know lots of students have moved from one region to another just simply because they can't get anybody to pay them a higher uh, um, salary rate because they've already worked for so cheap. And uh, you don't want to do that. You want to you want to say what you're worth, and 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 don't compromise. So these are the ways that you maintain the viability of your brand. Um, and one of the things we want to think about is something called a brand promise. A brand promise means that as a service, as an entity, as a a talent that's out there, you're offering something that people want and you have to figure out what it is and one of the ways that we can do that is look at what other great corporations do corporations have a lot of people that manage their brand that spend time thinking about it spend time promoting it and protect, protecting it and so forth but each company that offers its uh, products and services to the world can probably summarize what it is they're all about and if you look at the, the really great companies, you'll find what it is that's important to them. Uh, Amazon is a, a, a great company. They're providing probably most of our goods and services uh, over internet sales these days. And uh, they have consistently focused in on one thing. Uh, they began by selling books online. Then they added clothing and other things. Now they sell food. They sell everything. I don't even know what they don't sell. I mean, I would be hard pressed to know. It might be a fun game just to figure out what things you can't buy on Amazon. You know, can you buy uh, uh, an earth loader? <laughs> can you buy a helicopter? I don't know, maybe you can. Uh, but Amazon has an enormous repertoire of things, but their, their brand isn't, we sell everything. And, uh, they're probably the first place you go to to buy stuff. They're not necessarily always the cheapest. If there's a particular product that you wanted, I'm sure if you searched on the internet enough, you would um, uh, find somebody that was cheaper on a particular item. Uh, they're probably very cheap. They, 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 uh, they buy in bulk and they control prices. So you can usually in the long run pay less, but on a specific particular you know, line item, Amazon's brand promise is not, we are the cheapest. That's not what they're about. What Amazon was focused on from the very beginning and is still laser focused on is to make the experience of buying easier from them than anywhere else. They are fanatically focused on customer service. They were the very first ones to put in the, uh, the programming and uh, the trouble to make one-click purchase. In the early days of the internet, if you wanted to buy something with a credit card, uh, it took a lot of trouble to enter your credit card in and, you, and, and nothing got stored and you'd have to enter the information again and again and again. And uh, they, they went and did all the programming necessary to invent one-click purchase. So once that your credit card information was entered once, uh, you never had to enter it again. And that made purchasing simpler. And uh, lately, uh, they've been obsessed with how fast can they get your goods to you. So it used to be that they were promising to get it to you within two days. Two days became one day. And now if you live in a certain area, you can get stuff delivered the very same day. And how are they doing that? Well, they're building warehouses everywhere. There used to be one giant warehouse in Seattle. And how far you lived from Seattle maybe determined how fast you got your package from Amazon. Nowadays, uh, there are giant warehouses everywhere. And, uh, you know, through their studying of logistics and so forth, they know where all the purchasing is coming from. They know what the people in those areas are looking for. And they are doing everything they can to store their goods as close to you as possible so that the, the delivery time 
almost becomes instantaneous. And every one of those actions that Amazon has taken is to make it that much easier for you to purchase so that it just becomes a reflex to buy from Amazon. Their brand promise is we are the easiest place to shop from. We want you just to fall into a pattern and never think about it. And uh, some of the things they're doing are almost insidious. Uh, they, they came up with the, uh, uh, the house assistant, Alexis, that will talk to you, which is kind of fun. But what is the purpose of that house assistant? Well, that house assistant is allow you to order goods and services just by talking to it. And there's, there's a button that you can put on your refrigerator that you just push the button and you reorder milk. And so they're making it so easy for you to purchase that you almost don't think about it anymore. Um, we wonder about our own privacy, but these are all choices that we've made because Amazon is going to do these services for us. So Amazon's brand promises, we will make it easier to buy from us than for anybody else. So think about what your own brand promise might be. Uh, brand, some companies handle their, their promises to customers very, very differently. One of the worst corporations there in the world is Comcast. They're a cable television company. Cable televisions began life as monopolies. Different regions would hire different companies to provide cable television service. And they would be the only company in that area to provide cable. And, you know, so there were lots of different cable companies, but they were all providing different markets. And eventually they, they conglomerated. Comcast is the biggest. Uh, they don't own every market, but they probably own 40% or more of, of the United States market. And everywhere they exist, they're in a monopoly. They don't have any customer, they don't have any rivals for their service. And that's led them to be very arrogant. And so one of the things Comcast hates to do is give customer service. They have specifically designed their phone support to be frustrating so people will hang up rather than hang on the line to try to get technical support. Um, I'm not making that up. That is actually their policy. So Comcast's brand has become so toxic that there are actually areas in the country where uh, they they do have to compete with other cable companies on a, on a basis of you know who's got the best product. And Comcast has found that their name is so toxic that they can't sell their services as Comcast. So they invented a sub company called Xfinity. And if you ever see Xfinity, it's actually Comcast Cable under a different name. They had to invent that name so that uh, they could compete with uh, in, in, in an open market. So um, not all companies are um, nice to their customers or even uh, uh, interested in them. Somehow Comcast has just figured that they're going to have your money no matter what, so they don't want to have to be nice to you. And then there are companies that, that run into trouble and they do something about it. Samsung is a great company. Samsung is a very innovative company. They sell lots of different products. Uh, they're Korean, and uh, they sell refrigerators and motors and, and uh, semiconductor chips. And they have an enormous, a very popular smart phone line, mobile phone line. And a couple of years ago, they had some very bad luck where they put out a brand new phone, the best phone on their, uh, that they were selling. And it had a, a problem. There started to be reports when the phone just got released that it would smoke or catch fire or even explode when it was in someone's hand or in their pocket. And no one quite knew what was going on. It was a mystery because there wasn't enough data to yet figure out what was happening. But rather than uh, deny the problem or shrink from it, Samsung stepped forward and they pulled all of their phones from the market before they actually even knew what the problem was. They didn't want their customers to be hurt. They didn't want to be associated with selling a bad product. And it cost them billions of dollars to withdraw their phone from the market for that season. And very shortly after they withdrew it from the market, they came forward and confessed that it was their own design flaw that it had caused the problem. Um, 
the cellular the, the batteries in cellular phones have to recharge and they generate heat as they recharge and they apparently designed the phone so that uh, the cellular batteries were too close to another component that when it overheated caused these sparks and uh, explosions and so they withdrew the phone completely from the market and took that loss but the very next season they had a new redesigned phone out that was just as popular and 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 worked with no flaws and uh it's been a couple of years they have not seen any drop in their market or reputation and so when a when a company steps forward and responds to um ill events with responsibility their customers can have faith in them that they they're a brand that can be trusted so if you want to make a brand promise about yourself here are the, some rules about what a brand promise is. A brand promise needs to be credible. It must come from a place of the heart of authenticity. It should be something that is aligned with who you are. It must have value or benefit to the people you want to serve. It's no good at having a brand promise that you're going to deliver something that no one wants, but it must be a value or a benefit to the people that you're uh, trying to serve. And most importantly, the thing about a brand promise is that it's kept. You're making a promise to your customers, I will deliver X. And therefore, you have to consistently deliver on that. And your organization's story becomes a powerful set of storytelling because your being is caught up in delivering this service or good to the people. And so... As we think about how can we sell our creative services to the lot wider world, these are some important ideas to keep in mind. Uh, for some of us who just want to be an employee, maybe it's not going to be that big a deal. But a lot of us are going to work from company to company. You may work for so long uh, at one company and gain some new skills, move on, and have uh, you know lots of different experiences with lots of different creative companies. And if that is your um, path in life, then figuring out the brand that you want to put forth and adding all of the experiences to your brand is um, the way you want to think about your career. So this presentation that we've had you do this month where you're introducing yourself as a brand, as a service that companies can take advantage of is a useful way for you to think about who you are and who you want to become. And I, won't, I hope most of you took to heart the notion that you're selling the person you want to be, not the person you are now. You know, sometimes it's embarrassing to talk about yourself. Um, but this is not you that you're talking about. It's the you that you're going to become. And, uh, you know, that's a fictional person until you become that person. But if you have a clear notion of who that is, then your path through the next several months becomes much clearer because you have a goal that you're aiming towards. So Nancy Duarte has, has offered her ideas on how to use presentations to spread your ideas, to connect to people, to, to show people what's in your heart. And I hope that you guys can take all of that to heart. You can, you can think of different ways to tell stories, different ways to use your voice to communicate what it is you know and what it is you feel to people. And that you can use presentations, the idea of presentations, to move everyone, to change the world, to sell yourself, to sell your ideas, to bring people together. That's what we're all hoping for. So I, I hope you remember the, the readings in these books as you go forward in your next classes. Now, um, I mentioned feedback. There are actual rules to giving and receiving feedback. And I want to talk about that just real briefly. Um, feedback is something that will help you to understand more about what your own process is. Uh, the first rule of giving feedback is create safety. And what we mean by that is that 
you don't want to go seeking feedback in areas that are uh, notoriously uh, mean. I would not go on Facebook or Reddit and throw up my project and say, hey, guys, what do you think? Because you're just basically inviting an anonymous troll to say something mean. We don't know why trolls do what they do, but um, we can't stop them. You know, uh, we just have to know where they live and and and, and uh, stay away. But there are places where you can ask for help from your colleagues, where you know they have your best interests at heart. And when you're in a, working in a creative corporation, your workmates are that arena. And here, while you're here at school. Our discussion boards should be that kind of arena. You know, we are, uh, as teachers, maintaining the discussion boards. We're making sure that everyone's interactions with everyone else is professional and collegiate. Uh, and, and so we want you to think that the discussion boards are a place where you can post your work and ask for honest feedback and not feel like someone's going to be taking any cheap shots. Everyone here has everyone else's best interests at heart. So you want to seek feedback in areas, zones, where you know that you can trust the people that are, are going to give you that feedback. Uh, the next thing is be positive. Now, be positive is not the same as saying nice, say only nice things. Be positive means talk about the things that can be changed. Oftentimes, we are tasked with a project. You guys have been tasked with a project. I told you that you have to do make a three to four minute presentation about yourself and your skills, talking to the dream audience that you want to hire you. All of that brief was given to you by me. That's part of the assignment. It cannot change. So none of the feedback about your work should be pushing at those edges. Uh, you shouldn't have someone telling you, oh, you need to talk for 10 or 12 minutes because it works better that way. No, I, the assignment itself is designed for three to four minutes. So you want to talk about changing the things that can and should be changed and leaving alone the actual uh, parameters of the assignment. Uh, and along with be positive is be specific. It doesn't do anyone any good uh, to, to give you your opinion if you don't let them know how to deal with it. An example might be that someone's talking about your, your uh, slides and they say, I don't like your fonts. Okay, that's a valid opinion, but it's lousy feedback because other than saying that you don't like it, you haven't told that person anything about how they could possibly change it. You know, uh, another better way to say that is, I'm worried about your fonts. I think maybe they're too thin. If you look at them from a distance, they're hard to read. Now that's specific enough that you know that the person is recommending that you make the fonts thicker, that they would be better read that way. And so you can evaluate that option and choose to make the fonts thicker or not, or use a specific typeface. When someone wants, when you want to give someone a suggestion, being as specific as possible about your suggestions, if you have specific colors in mind, if you have specific fonts or, or images or, or, or uh, things to say in mind, put that there. So the person who's gate receiving the feedback has a way to evaluate what could and should be done. And they have a path to making those changes. Just telling us you don't like something doesn't help. Telling us how you can change it to be positive, uh, be actionable, uh, that's what makes sense. Be immediate. Now, I'm not, uh, I'm not busting out a spoiler here to, know, to tell you that you're on deadline. Everybody's supposed to have their final version done by Sunday night. That's why we have timetables here. And when you go out into the wider world and you're working at a creative company, it's not a, uh, you know, it's not a stretch to say that you're going to be on deadline for the rest of your life. Every single project has deadlines. Usually they're outrageous. But when someone asks for feedback, you've got to know that that person working on that project 
has a timeline. So if you can't give them feedback right then and there when they're asking, you need to ask what their parameters are so that if you want to be helpful, knowing when you can give feedback is a good idea. You know, if someone posts their project in the discussion board and asks for feedback and you don't give them feedback until 1030 at night on Sunday, well, thanks, but no thanks. You may have given me a great idea, but it's too late for me to put that into my project. You have to have timeliness about your feedback so that you fit into this uh, the work plate, the work structure that everyone's going with. And finally, provide tough love. If someone is completely wrong, if they made a huge mistake, uh, you're not doing them any favors by ignoring that. They're going to find out eventually. And all you've done is, is cost them a little more time. So as a friend, as someone who has their interests in heart, there are ways to tell people that the hard truths that you've misunderstood the project, that you're doing this wrong, that you have to start over, whatever. Um, you can tell people this in ways that, that don't hurt uh, or aren't um, embarrassing, but are helpful. And know that if you're not the one telling them, it might be someone else who might be a little more judgmental, a little more harsh, uh, a little more cruel. So if you're a friend and someone has a uh, need of knowing what's right or wrong about their project and it's really wrong, find the way to tell them in such a way that you're, you're just being proactive, that you're just helping them get back on track. Provide tough love. Now, there are rules for receiving criticism as well. And the first rule of that, cultivate a mind, a growth mindset. Now, what I mean by that is that a lot of times people say they want feedback and they don't really. What they want are compliments. And a lot of times people go into a critique and the first thing they'll do before they let anybody see their work is go through a long list of things that they think are wrong with the work sort of pre-arming themselves against these, these critiques. That's a bad way to go. First of all, for most of the things you're going to mention, if you hadn't said a word, most people wouldn't have noticed it. They aren't thinking about things the same way you are. But most importantly, if you're going to ask people to help you by giving you their honest opinion, then you owe it to them to hear what they have to say. An awful lot of times, people will be, get very defensive, and as soon as someone mentions something, they'll jump in. You know, you might say, oh, well, I thought your audio was a little bit scratchy. And then you'll jump in and say, you know, that's not my fault. It was the microphone. The microphone was, 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 was not very good, blah, blah, blah. And it could be, you could be completely right. But the problem is, if you cut someone off when they're giving you feedback, what they're really hearing is, I don't want to hear your opinion. And they will never, ever give you feedback again. Someone is doing you an enormous favor by giving you feedback. And you have to return that courtesy by hearing everything they have to say. Even if you have to rebut what they have to say or arm them with some, some knowledge uh, or you know be defensive, uh, it's not a good idea to be defensive. But... Uh, I know a lot of people can't help it, but at least let the person get their full thought out before you jump back. Because when you cut someone off in the middle of giving you feedback, you're really telling them, I don't value your opinion. And that is rude and unfair. So cultivate a growth, growth mindset. If people are going to give you the honor of giving you their opinion, listen to the whole opinion before you ever talk or respond. Take credit for your mistakes. So if someone mentions something and you know that to be true, that could be a bonding moment. That could be a moment where you kind of let some tension out. You know, I know I should have done this other thing. I, I, I was being lazy or uh, I forgot to fix it or whatnot. But take credit for your mistakes. If someone points something out and you completely agree, then that, makes the, that means the both of you are looking at the project 
in the same way. And that actually uh, is good news. Uh, focus on self-improvement. One of the things you're gonna find with feedback is that everyone is interested in different things. And so you may get feedback on a lot of stuff you, that you consider irrelevant. People will tell you, you know, uh, the hat should be brown instead of blue and that that doesn't matter to you. Well, people can give you their opinions and those are good, but it's up to you as the person who is receiving feedback to evaluate the opinions and say, this is helpful to me, this is constructive, this is, in, this is interesting information, but it's not relevant. So you do not have an obligation to follow all the feedback. You have an obligation to consider all the feedback. And even feedback that you receive from me as your teacher, I want you to be very, very clear. As your teacher, when I'm giving you feedback, I'm not telling you what you have to do. I'm telling you what you might do. And it's still your project. And you are deciding whether this is a change that you should or shouldn't make. So that's an important distinction that you're always doing. You're evaluating feedback. And uh, you know it's important for you to consider it all. But then it's important for you to make your own uh, decision as well. Learn from criticism. Sometimes you're not really going to be able to ever square things out. One person might like blue and another person like brown. Well, just take that in and that becomes information that you know about the world. Uh, you're not always going to be able to resolve all uh, personal choices. But you will be able to just take that in as extra information. And it will help you in the long run to know that, uh, you know, not everybody uh, loves strawberries. Um, and finally, find lessons and inspiration in the success of others. We all want to help each other get better. If you see someone else have a great project, celebrate that. And then steal that idea for yourself next time. Because we're all helping each other grow and be better. So we actually have a project uh, this week in which we want you to engage in creating feedback. Now, I mentioned that uh, what I want everyone to do, if they're so inclined, is to go to uh, last week's discussion board and post your 3.4 uh, first draft up and ask your classmates for feedback. So if you haven't done that yet, you might do that today or tomorrow. And uh, note that the um, 3.4 discussion board has been left open for all week. So it is active this week. You can continue to post. And uh, I believe we have a couple of people who've posted their projects uh, and so forth, uh, not in this discussion board, uh, in the other one, perhaps. But uh, if you do want feedback from your classmates, uh, take the project that you turned in last night or you're, if you're still working on it. There's several of you that, that uh, didn't get it done and I extended your timeline and I'm hoping to receive them today or tomorrow. And, and as you give me your projects, I will give you feedback on them. But uh, also you can post them in the discussion board, 3.3, and ask classmates to give you feedback. And I can't guarantee that they'll give you feedback. So um, this is a voluntary thing. Uh, mostly if you want feedback from some other people, then you should give feedback yourself as well uh, in, the, in the spirit of uh, giving and receiving. But to make sure that everybody in the class has experience with creating uh, uh, feedback, we have an assignment, 4.3, called Presentation Feedback. And this is a lot like the 1.4 assignment in first week with TED Talks. We have three different projects that we, or uh, we have three different presentations that we want you to watch and we want you to critique them. We want you to say what they did right, what they did wrong, and I want you to give some positive feedback on things they could do to make their presentation better. And this month, we're doing it a little bit differently in honor of Hall of Fame, which I hope some of you had some experience of uh, in week two. Uh, the 
instead of using student projects from previous years, previous months, uh, the three uh, the three presentations that we're going to put up are the accepted speeches by some of our previous Hall of Fame winners. We have Leslie Brethwaite. Um, we have this year's uh, game design winner. Uh, I forget the girl's name. Uh, it's in here. But uh, you're going to see an accepted speech. They, these are like five or five to ten minute speeches in which uh, they they talk about their time at Full Sail and how happy they are to receive this awards and so forth. And they're giving a speech. So they're not necessarily showing slides or doing anything like that. They're basically just giving an oral presentation. But I want you to watch what they're doing, pick one, and give me a short write-up on what they did right, what they did wrong, and give me some feedback on how they could improve their performance. So this is your chance to practice giving feedback. And of course, it's important to read the instructions. The instructions, we want you to download them. Um, they contain the links to the performances. So on page two, link one, two, and three are these Hall of Fame inductions. But if you read in the instructions, we're telling you what we want you to say. We want you to write two or three paragraphs, not a long, this is not a very long writing assignment. It should take more than 15 minutes or so after you watched the three presentations and, and chosen one. We only want you to do one. You don't have to do all three, but just choose one and say, what did you like about it? What part was uh, good? What, what worked better? and give them some advice on how they could improve their presentation. And then after you've written one or two paragraphs on that presentation, the final step is add a final paragraph reflecting your own thoughts and feedback and how this process might inform your critique and process and, 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 and feedback process. So read through the instructions, answer the questions that are here in paragraph form and add your own thoughts about how feedback informs your own work. That's what we're looking for. This should be a text document. You don't have to add any pictures to it. You don't have to do anything special. You don't have to make a presentation out of it. It's just three uh, short paragraphs in a text document. You could do it in Word. You could actually write it in the um, feedback area in the um, um, submission page down here if you like. Uh, th that works for me. But the easiest thing to do is to write it as a text document, turn it in. That's due on Sunday. So it shouldn't take very long, but it'll give you a chance to see the, uh, the, the acceptance speeches by these three Hall of Fame inductees, and you'll find that pretty fascinating. And it'll feel a little bit like you participated in Hall of Fame week for that. And then the only other thing that's going on this week is you're turning in your final presentation. So with feedback from me, possibly some feedback from your uh, classmates and your own ideas of what you liked and didn't like about your first draft, I want you to revise the project. I don't want anybody to start over, but revise your project. Most of you got your voiceovers done really well. There's only one or two people I advise to re-record the whole thing. But sometimes if you have to cut it down or change some parts, you might have to re-record, you know, a little section of it or something like that. Uh, a lot of you, you know, didn't have enough slides and I asked for more slides. But um, in terms of what I want in the final, it has to be changed. It doesn't have to be changed X amount, there's not a, a particular rule, but we do ask that when you turn in your final project, you also turn in what we call a changes list. And the changes list are telling us what changes you did from last week to this week. And uh, you know, that will also tell me, you know, uh, which parts of my feedback you evaluated and so forth. But the changes list can be uh, something you put in the feedback document or feedback post, you can put it in a short document that goes alongside. 
it doesn't really belong in the final uh, submission. And another aspect of the final submission that I want all the projects to uh, exhibit is that they're self-running. If you're working on a PowerPoint project and I've had to click to advance slides or click to engage the audio, that was okay for the first draft. But for the final draft, I want to open the file and it just runs itself from there and on. So uh, automatic timings, syncings are in place, uh, no, no click to engage audio, everything runs automatically is a PowerPoint file or what other projects you did it. And uh, the very best way to ensure that happens is to export the project as a movie, as an as a MPEG-4 or a movie file. And once you do that, you have the ability to possibly put it on YouTube or post it as a, a an MPEG-4. Um, those are good ways to archive your work. Uh, those of you that have accounts with um, Google or YouTube, YouTube is a terrific way to uh, archive your schoolwork. You're using their storage, not yours. And um, if you're storing movies that are kind of large, then you can use uh, their storage. And, and, uh, and it makes it very easy to share your projects because you're just sharing links at that point. You're no longer giving up three or four megabyte files. Uh, and that could take a lot of time sometimes. So um, we recommend that you put your final work uh, archived on video to YouTube. It's not a rule. It's just a good practice that you might get into. Um, and so uh, the other thing I want to mention is that uh, those are the projects for this week. So you, you turn in your final uh, presentation. You turn in your feedback uh, uh text and you're done and when sunday at midnight passes your next class is going to open up for most of you that class is called pyp the psychology of play it's a really cool class it has to do with work play balance and psychological processes and so forth and i, I think most students really enjoy it so that class will become available to you just as soon as this class closes down now, this class is going to continue to be available to you for about two weeks. So if you have a, a project that you have to turn in late or um, you want to come back and see what your grades were, you can get access to this until the grades get posted officially with the school. And there is one last thing that we're asking you to, uh, to, uh, to do. It's called the Portfolio Competency Self-Reflection. Either write some words or pull out your video cam and just give us some straight talk into that camera, but talk about your feelings about the class. How did you do? What were you expecting this class to be? Uh, did it meet those expectations? Uh, how do you feel about what you did and so forth? These are things that help us to make the class better. Uh, it's not actually part of the grade, but we do expect you to do it for us. So try to fill that out and that'll be the last thing you should do. Uh, you shouldn't do that until you finished all the other work in the class. And uh, again, uh, access to this class will go away about two months, two weeks after it closes in mid-April. Uh, but all the grades should be officially posted by then. So uh, as you guys move forward, you know, uh, we'll be here and uh, uh, cheering you on and hoping you use your knowledge of creative presentation to do really cool projects in all your new classes. And I hope everyone stays safe. I know that we're in a really spooky time because of the uh, um, the, the, the virus that's going around and, and everybody uh, being quarantined and so forth. Uh, it's an ideal time to be studying online, but uh, it, it makes the rest of your life that much scarier. Uh, but uh, we're here for you. Anybody that's got questions, anybody that's having difficulties integrating uh, audio and, and slides together, I want to be available for you this week to fix that. Anybody that has other questions, uh, I want to be around. So uh, anybody that needs my help, get a hold of me, and, and I'm here for you. Otherwise, I hope you guys have a great career here at Full Sail and you go on to bigger and better things. This has been a really fun class, and I'm really proud of you guys.
Good night.